Assalamu alaikum. I am Dr. Aribati. I will be the moderator for this session. I welcome you all on the 44th Annual Conference of Pakistan Association of Pathologists and 9th Joint Conference of Societies of Pathology. Uh, now, our first speaker for the session two are Dr. Nasruddin, very well-known name in the soft tissue pathology who doesn't need any introduction. Today, he will be discussing the topic soft, uh, bone and soft tissue round cell tumors an update. Please, Dr. Nasser. Uh, thank you. I would like to introduce our chair and co-chair, Dr. Sajid Mushtaq and Dr. Omar Chukhtai. And he will be sitting in the audience. Okay, another announcement uh, for the membership of HCSP Society. The forms are available at the registration desk and that can be submitted to General Hafiz and Dr. Tahir, that is the secretary of the HSCP. And you can also make payment there. Thank you. Later on. Yeah, later on. Thank you, Dr. Aiba, for the introduction. Uh, I will uh, give an update on uh, small round cell. Uh, tumor subbone and soft tissue. Small round cell uh, tumors of soft tissue and bone uh, constitute a divergent group of neoplasms. Uh, these often demonstrate overlapping clinical and radiological uh, characteristics and share histomorphologic and sometimes immunophenotypic similarities. But they are uh, typically have uh, diverse prognostic outcomes, thus warranting uh, different clinical uh, management. Morphologically, these tumors are look alike and composed of monomorphic, small, uh, undifferentiated cells with uh, increased NC ratio. The differential diagnosis of these tumors is particularly difficult uh, because of their undifferentiated or uh, primitive uh, character. Moreover, the overlapping histologic, immunohistochemical, and molecular features create diagnostic challenges despite significant clinical and prognostic differences as well as uh, therapeutic indications. Recent molecular genetics uh, advances have identified a growing list of round cell sarcomas, thus having revolutionized the diagnosis of sarcomas and provided insight into potential therapeutic targets as well as prognostic biomarkers. The list of small round cell sarcomas is long, but in the interest of time, uh, I'm going to discuss the first four round cell sarcomas. Ewing sarcoma was first uh, described by James Ewing in 1921 in a series of uh, cases composed of polyhelial cells arising in bones of adolescents. Similar neoplasms were subsequently reported as a skin tumor and PNET, these tumors share a common cytogenetic event, which is translocation 11.22. And thus, these represent one and the same neoplastic process. Ewing sarcoma is defined as a neoplasm involving fusion of a FET, which stands for FUS, EWSR1, and TF15, RNA binding protein, to an ETS, which stands for E26 transformation specific sequence transcription factor, which includes FLI1, ERG, ETV1, and 4, and FEB. It is the second most common malignant tumor of bone in children and young adults with peak incidence due in the second decade of life. Patients older than 30 years often uh, affect the soft tissue. In the long bones, they typically arise in the diaphysis or metadiaphysis with a characteristic ill-defined, multi-layer uh, periosteal reaction called onion skin uh, appearance. Exoskeletal Ewing sarcoma has a wide distribution of anatomic sites, including visceral organs. Histologically, Ewing sarcoma is composed of monomorphic population of small round cells arranged in uh, solid sheets with scanned snowflake to clear cytoplasm, little uh, stroma. It can sometimes show 
Homer writes pseudologists, which in the past have been called as PNET. In 95% of cases, there is diffuse strong membranous uh, CD99 positivity. NKX 2.2 show nuclear positivity in most of the cases, but it is sensitive but not specific. Ewing sarcoma can show focal cytokratin expression in up to 30% of cases. Uh, FLI1 and ERG, which are also vascular markers, are often expressed in those Ewing sarcoma cases showing corresponding uh, gene fusions. It should be noted that FLI1 can also be positive in lymphoblastic lymphoma, in a plastic large cell lymphoma, and as well as synovial sarcoma. Similarly, ERG can also be uh, positive in acute myeloid leukemia, epithelioid sarcoma, and a subset of uh, prostate carcinoma. Cytogenetically, Ewing sarcoma is characterized by translocation element 22 in 85% of cases, uh, which, and resultant fusion genes are EWSR1 with FLI1. In 10% of cases, uh, ERG fuses with the EWSR1, and in other uh, cases, there are different partner genes. In some cases, first replaces the EWSR1, I shall touch this case in the subsequent, uh, this group in the subsequent slides. Fish analysis using a break apart probe is highly sensitive in detecting EWSR1 rearrangements, but it does not uh, identify the translocation uh, partner. RT PCR analysis is more specific in identifying the fusion partner, but has suboptimal sensitivity in formalin fixed paraffin embedded tissue. Essential and desirable diagnostic criteria, essential are small round cell morphology, CD99 membranes expression. Desirable FET, ETS fusion uh, in uh, selected cases. So differential diagnosis of uh, Ewing sarcoma include B core associated sarcoma, and morphologic clue is uh, spindling and myxoid background. Uh, this uh, sarcoma is positive for B core uh, and usually said B2 positive. Small cell osteosarcoma may have subtle osteoid matrix. It is positive for said B2, but CD99 positivity is uh, not more than focal. Mesenchymal chondrosarcoma comes in a differential diagnosis, but chondroid matrix is uh, the uh, clue for the diagnosis. So Ewing sarcoma displays a high propensity for distant metastasis. Uh, and most common sites being lung and bone. The prognosis has been improved uh, with the current multi-model uh, therapeutic uh, agents. The next group is round cell sarcoma with EWSR1 with non-ETS fusions. This is an emerging subgroup of small round and spindle cell sarcomas with fusions between uh, FET RNA binding protein and a gene gene unrelated to ETS transcription factor uh, family. The current WHO classification uh, lists EWSR1 or first with NFAT C2 and EWSR1 with paired uh, Z1. These tumors has been previously regarded as Ewing like sarcomas. There is wide age distribution for this group of tumors uh, and each uh, group has a uh, very uh, small number of cases uh, published in the literature. The NFATC2 sarcomas predominantly affect the bones with a strong male predominance, uh, while paired Z1 uh, sarcomas arise in do uh, deep soft tissues, especially chest wall. These are positive for agricane and CD99, and staining can be membranous, cytoplasmic, and dot like. These Sarcomas may show focal dot like uh, keratin or EMS staining. These are mostly treated similar to Ewing sarcoma with generally unfavorable outcomes. This is an example of NFAT C2 associated sarcoma. Uh, you can see anastomosing cords of small monomorphic round cells present in a myxoid and uh, collagenized background. The third uh, group is sick rearranged sarcoma. It was first described in 226 in two cases of Ewing-like sarcoma. 
which were found to harbor a recurrent translocation 419 and resultant fusion between uh, sick and Dux4. To date, sick with Dux4 fusion is the most frequent genetic alteration in EWSR1 or first negative undifferentiated small cell, uh, small round cell tumors. A number of other uh, partner genes apart from Dux4 have been identified, which includes uh, FOXO4 and others. Sick Dux sarcoma primarily occurs in deep soft tissues of the limbs and trunk, more commonly in young adults with a median age of 29 years. Histologically, they look like Ewing sarcoma, but they show mild variation in size and shape. Uh, in solid uh, sheets and focal uh, lobules. Uh, the cytoplasm is isonophilic to amphophilic with doll like uh, nuclei. Focal myxoid background can be seen and it shows high mitotic activity and uh, areas of necrosis. There is uh, CD99, variable CD99 positivity in up to 50% of cases. And in 75% of cases, there is uh, nuclear WT1 positivity against the both clones, C and N terminus. And ATB4 positivity can be seen in up to 93% of cases. Essential and desirable diagnostic criteria in essential one is the predominant round cell phenotype, mild nuclear pleomorphism, epithelioid and or spindle cell components, variably myxoid stroma. Immunoprofile shows variable CD99 staining with frequent WT1 and ETV positivity. And desirable is sick rearrangement uh, in selected cases. These sarcomas are treated on Ewing sarcoma protocol, but show uh, worse prognosis as compared to uh, Ewing sarcoma. And this time metastasis is frequent, mostly, most commonly to lung. The last uh, sarcoma is sarcoma B with B core genetic alterations. It was uh, described in uh, 2012 on four cases of round cell sarcoma of bone lacking the canonical TET ETS translocation and B core uh, with CC and B3 fusion was found. Additional fu uh, gene fusions involving B core have also been subsequently found, including B core with internal internal tandem duplication, B core, MAL, uh, MAML3, and others. B core, CC, and then B3 sarcomas most frequently arise in bone than soft tissue uh, and show a striking predilection for children and a male uh, predominant. B core internal tandem duplication tumors preferentially uh, occurs in the somatic soft tissues of the trunk, abdomen, head, and neck. Uh, sparing the extremities. Histologically, uh, these tumors are composed of uh, alternate, mostly alternate hyper and hypercellular areas, and the cells are monomorphic round to uh, ovoid with a prominent vasculature which ranges from dilated uh, hemangioparacytoma like vasculature to chicken wire vasculature. So this pattern morphologically looks like a clear cell sarcoma of kidney and is a very useful uh, feature to suspect this uh, B core rearranged sarcoma uh, on HNE. And these sarcoma also show a variable myxoid and collagenized background. There is variable CD99 positivity in addition to TLE1, uh, cyclene D1, set B2, and B core uh, nuclear staining is seen in uh, most cases. Essential and uh, desirable diagnostic criteria essential is primitive round to spindle cells arranged in nest sheets or fascicular growth pattern, variable myxoid stroma with deli uh, delicate vasculatures, immunostochemical positivity for B core, set B2, and cyclin B1 and desirable in selected cases is molecular confirmation of a B core genetic abnormality. The prognosis of B core uh, CC and B3 sarcomas is similar to uh, Ewing sarcoma 
whereas the outcomes of other tumors with uh, B core family are not well characterized. These growing uh, family of B core tumors, which in addition to uh, B core CCNNB3 fusion uh, bone and soft tissue sarcoma, also includes clear cell sarcoma of, uh, uh, sarcoma of kidney, which show uh, the fusion pattern is ITD. Uh, B core CCNN, uh, CCNB3 real cell sarcoma has also been reported. Uh, and this fusion is seen uh, in primitive myxoid, means in camel tumor of uh, infancy, as well as uh, in some cases of uh, ossifying fibromyxoid tumor of soft tissue, especially those with uh, S100 negativity uh, and malignant variants, as well as a subset of uh, high grade endometrial stromal sarcomas. So in conclusions, uh, immunostochemistry plays a vital role in rendering a specific diagnosis or narrowing the differential diagnosis in small round cell tumors of soft tissue and bone. Molecular genetic studies are often needed, especially for those lesions with unusual histologic features and uncommon immunoprofile and or unusual uh, clinical presentation. Accurate diagnosis of these tumors uh, necessitates recognition of salient histologic features judicious and astute use of ancillary studies and correlation with the clinical and radiological uh, characteristics to guide clinical decision making. And thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Dr. Nasser, for such an elaborative talk. Our next speaker is Dr. Sara Thor. She is currently working as Director of Affairs of Histopathology Department and a well-known name in soft tissue pathology. Please, Dr. Saira. And the topic of her talk is uh, Advances in the Sarcoma Diagnosis and Challenges in Current Local Practice. Thank you very much, Dr. Ariba. Bismillah rahman rahim Assalamu alaikum. Um, after a very thoughtful, um, thought-provoking talk by Dr. Shafi Gill in the morning, I think my talk is a sequel uh, to that of his talk. I'll be talking about advances in sarcoma diagnosis and challenges in current local practice. And I'm Dr. Saira Rathor, consultant histopathologist at Chukta Institute of Pathology. Well, as far as soft tissue uh, tumors are concerned, we know that soft tissue sarcomas are a heterogeneous group of tumors with a wide range of differentiation and morphological diversity. And the evolution of the WHO classification has always been a very slow process and it evolved over decades. So the earlier classification was largely descriptive and was morphology based where the cell types were taken into account while classifying the tumors. So we had round cell sarcomas, spindle cell sarcomas. But then with the passage of time, uh, the line of differentiation was taken into account while describing the tumors. And then we came up with the lineage-based classification. And uh, that included like adipocytic tumors, fibroblastic tumors, fibrohistocytic tumors. But with the involvement of a large number of sarcoma expert pathologists, the classification was further refined and then the lineage-based classification was further subcategorized into B9, intermediate, and malignant categories. And uh, that was all based on the prognosis and behavior of the tumors. But it was for the first time that in 2020, the 2020 WHO classification of soft tissue sarcomas that introduced a multidisciplinary approach. And that multidisciplinary approach actually had representatives from different clinical disciplines who sat together uh, to understand the etiology and the disease process down to its, uh, like its genetic basis, and that actually revolutionized the entire spectrum of soft tissue sarcomas. And this is the WHO classification the, of uh, soft tissue and bone tumors, the fifth edition we are all very much aware of. And all this was aimed to produce a pathological report which can be translated into a better management-induced um, uh, oriented report. And that led to the, actually the basis of personalized medicine. And the WHO classification continues to evolve as new genetic abnormalities are identified. And with the uh, like advances, 
in the fields of molecular pathology, digital pathology, and artificial intelligence. And we also are aware that with new challenges come, with new, with new advances come new uh, challenges. So the challenges in general that we face are related to the healthcare system and in keeping ourselves up to date and for the ongoing research. And we're also aware that the healthcare in general is expensive all over the world. And to deal with different countries have actually formulated and devised their own systems, which is meant for their people based on their social as well as their economic strata. For example, there is an insurance-based system in the USA, whereas it is government-funded in the UK, which is actually being run very effectively uh, by a very organized body, the NHS. And then we have a system, which is the private sector, which is everywhere. But what about Pakistan? We do not have an insurance-based system here. Yes, we do have a government-based system, but it's not as effective and organized as is the UK system is. And we do have a private sector, and they too have their limitations. The vast majority of the patients that usually are present in our country, they are non-affording. And these non-affording patients go actually to the government sector, government uh, healthcare uh, sector. And because of limited financial resources, it is not possible to cater these patients effectively. Therefore, most of the government institutions, they actually provide with the very basic tests or those tests which are cost effective. And if we come to the private sector, then most of the laboratories usually offer tests which are commercially feasible. And if and there, only, there are a few labs uh, here in Pakistan which are the centers of excellence and they do not only have the resources but also the expertise to utilize them. But unfortunately, they are uh, not uh, within the reach of the huge uh, burden of the non-affording patients. And all this results in the decreased learning opportunities. So, what's the way forward? So in our situation, the way forward is to think out of the box. We simply cannot apply the rules and regulations and the strategies that are devised by the high income countries that they have devised for their people based on their social and economic strata and expect them to work well in our situation as well. So we have to come up with our, to identify our own problems and uh, just uh, to know our own uh, limitations and then to devise a system by which we can effectively help our patient and use systems which best suit our social and economic strata. So we have to make a gap, uh, analyze the gap analysis. By gap analysis, it's meant to understand where we are and what we want to achieve and how that gap can be bridged. And once we identify the problem, so half of the problem is solved. So we are done with half of the problem. And the second half of the problem will be done once the solution to this is identified. So this is where we are. This is the huge, the huge burden of um, uh, this is the huge burden of the patients, which go to the public, uh, the government sector, and the small number of the private labs, which are do uh, offering their services, but they are not enough to cater these uh, areas as well. And we cannot only rely upon the the few centers of excellence that we have. So we have to bridge the gap, and that is only possible through knowledge sharing and resource sharing. And as far as knowledge sharing is concerned, I think um, there are a lot of activities they are usually going on all around the year um, in the form of courses, crash courses, workshops, seminars, conferences that are enough to guide academically the students. But we need to develop a culture of MDT. And that culture needs to be present within the departments within the institution at national as well as at international levels. And this is one way when the specialists from different disciplines will sit together, they'll have a better chance to understand the disease and they'll come up, especially the pathologists, then they'll be able to come up with a more meaningful report that is going to 
uh, treat the tumor burden in a better way. And as uh, earlier mentioned by Dr. Uh, Shafi Gill in his talk, effective communication to the referrals and a regular feedback for this, we need to develop a very strong and a very organized system between the government sector and the private sector and also among different private institutions. This is the way forward in our case. This is how we're going to share our knowledge and we're going to share our resources. And another thing, as far as um, sarcomas are concerned, I think it's high time that we should start a subspeciality fellowship in sarcoma pathology. This is uh, not an educational option. It is actually the need of the time. Basically, there, are, there is so much going on in sarcoma pathology. There is so much confusion regarding the diagnosis and the morphology of the sarcomas. And to keep with the, with the advances, the rapid advances that are going on in sarcomas, we need to develop more centers where we have or where we offer these training programs so that the learning opportunities can be provided to the, uh, to the trainees. And we cannot forget a very sincerely maintained and monitored um, cancer registry, a reliable cancer registry program, in fact. This is important so that the data uh, of that cancer registry be used by the policymakers, by the researchers, by the health authorities, and the health personnel so that uh, all this data can be used to develop strategies to overcome the challenges that we feel, uh, face regarding different tumors. And in the end, I would just like to share my concept of a dream team. Um, I think, in, in my opinion, actually, we need to mobilize the Muslim community, especially, to work together so that we can regain and revive the intellectual glory that we have lost long ago. And for this, we need to have some proactive individuals who are very committed and we need to have a platform that can bring all of these nations together for collaboration, communication, information sharing, and for expert transfer. And it is not possible without an efficient IT and information superhighway. And the first step towards fulfillment of a great dream is to have a great dream. And I have a dream. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Saira. That is such a like, nice talk and uh, like a dream for the pathology. Uh, now, our next speaker is Dr. Ahmadine Khaled Sheikh, currently serving as a head of pathology at Pence Institute. And today she will be talking on From Slides to Syndrome, a challenging case of neurofibromatosis. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Assalamu alaikum, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, uh, first of all, I would like to thank uh, the organizer of this society, especially uh, General Hafiz, for giving me this opportunity. And uh, Dr. Saira, I hope that your dream uh, come to a lot of prayers for that. Uh, I'm going to present a, a very interesting case. It was of a 42-year-old man who was a uh, laborer by profession. He belonged to the Valley of Azad Kashmir. And uh, three months back before presentation, he was perfectly well that he started to have melina. He went to a local GP and uh, he gave him some medication and his condition improved. But a couple of weeks after that, he again had these complaints. And at that time, uh, along with melina, he was also having pain in the abdomen. He, was, uh, uh, he also developed fever and uh, multiple episodes of diarrhea. He was also hypertensive and jaundice when he presented in the uh, emergency. The investigations that was ordered at time, uh, at that time, the, all the baseline investigations, they were within the normal limits except that he was anemic and he was showing uh, biochemical evidence of an obstructive jaundice. The ultrasound examination that was done at that time, it showed that he had two cystic lesions. One of them was involving the head of the pancreas and it was extending up to the duodenum. And the other uh, was involving the right adrenal gland and it was a multi-septated lesion. So to have a better view of these uh, um, abdominal lesions, the CT scan was ordered by the uh, uh, attending physician. 
And the CT scan, it shows that he had uh, 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 three lesions. Uh, one of them was an intraluminal lesion that were involving the ampullary region. And the radiologist suspected that this might be a neuroendocrine tumor or it can be an ampullary carcinoma. The second lesion was uh, involving the right adrenal gland. It was a uh, multi-septated lesion and it was very hemorrhagic. And the opinion was that it could be a primary lesion of the adrenal gland or it can be some metastatic uh, lesion from some other organ. And the third lesion was that uh, the in the, uh, in, the uh, in the head of the pancreas, and that was also a, a cystic lesion. And the opinion was that it could be a cystic dilatation of the duct, or it can be a cystic lesion of the pancreatic head, or it can be a metastatic lesion. So the uh, uh, ancillary lab investigations was done to rule out any pancreatic tumor or any uh, colorectal tumor, and uh, they were within the normal uh, limits. The VMA were uh, somewhat raised. So the multidisciplinary committee decided to have a surgical approach and the patient underwent a Whipple's procedure and a right adrenalectomy. So the specimen that was uh, received in our department, it was of a uh, pancreatoidectomy, a distal gastrectomy, cholecystectomy, along with a right adrenalectomy. The specimen of the duodenum, it was around 20 into 2, into 2 centimeters in size. And on the serosal size, as you can see the marks, there were three uh, nodules. And the largest of them measured 1 into 1 centimeter in diameter. The smallest one was 0.5 centimeter. And uh, the adrenal mass, it was uh, multilobulated. And uh, uh, it was weighing around 75 grams. And the cut section of it was 10 red. Uh, partially cystic, partially solid, the capsule was intact, it was 6 into 6 uh, into 3 centimeter and there were many areas of hemorrhages. So the microscopic examination from the ampullary nodule, it showed uh, unremarkable intestinal mucosa and on a closer look in the muscle we could see that there was a tumor uh, which was composed of a tubuloglandular structures and the nuclei they have somewhat uh, uh, stippled appearance and granular cytoplasm mitosis was only one we could identify, and there was no necrosis and not much ATB ever present. So we applied immunohistochemical. There was also scattered somoma bodies. Uh, they were very much uh, uh, there. And uh, the uh, immunohistochemistry that were applied, uh, it showed uh, chromogenin positivity. So this was a neuroendocrine tumor grade one with a very low chi-67 and it was just confined to the muscular layer. It was not invading into the pancreatic head. The other lesion that was present on the uh, serosa uh, from the uh, duodenum, it showed a circumscribed uh, lesion which was spindle in shape and uh, uh, um, it, it was also having no mitosis, no necrosis and uh, we applied immunohistochemical uh, markers on that and it came out to be positive. Uh, DOG1 and CD117, neurofibroma, schwannoma, and uh, 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 all the other spindle cell lesions, they were ruled out. And this was uh, just a gastrointestinal stromal tumor, and it was of low grade, low risk, and all the margins that were uh, subjective for histopathological examination, they were free. The third uh, uh, lesion was from the adrenal gland, and it has a zell balan pattern, and there was cytological atypia, hyperchromasia, the cells were polyagonal, and there was no spindling. There was no involvement of the periadrenal adipose tissue, no vascular capsular invasion was seen. So this came out to be a, a pheochromocytoma, synaptophysin was positive, and it has a low PASS score. So the, from the, uh, the pathological examination that was done from the pancreatic head, it showed that there was a lymphoplasmacytic infiltrate, no tumor was identified of any kind from there. Uh, it was chronic pa uh, pancreatitis. The other sections that were subjective for histopathological examination didn't reveal any tumor, and 16 lymph nodes that were identified, they show reactive hyperplasia. So three malig uh, malignancies were identified. One was a low-grade neuroendocrine tumor, other was a low-grade gist, and one was a um, uh, uh, pheochromocytoma with a low pass scoring. So the, the, the clinician was the opinion as it has a neuroendocrine tumor and a pheochromocytoma, it could be a case of uh, multiple endocrine uh, neoplasia in which you, uh, we know that multiple endocrine organs are involved and the tumors develop in them. But the gist was not fitting in that uh, case. 
So uh, we, we, we thought that this is some syndrome in which three tumors, they are presenting at the same time, but we didn't, at that time we didn't know what it was. So what happened that uh, one of the, when we went back to the patient and dig out and we find that around six months back he had some skin nodule for which he undergoed a biopsy and the biopsy was showing a neurofibroma. And when we uh, examined the patient, he had all the, he had cafe all his spots, he had multiple neurofibromas, all the pieces of the puzzle, they were put together. And this was a case of neurofibromatosis that presented with three malignancies. So as we know that uh, um, uh, neurofibromatosis or uh, von Recklinghausen disease is a, a multisystemic disease and the, the chromosome 17, uh, NF1 gene is there and it got mutated and it encodes a protein which is a neurofibromin and it acts as a tumor uh, suppressor for the RAS proton gene pathway and when this suppression is got there it start proliferation and this proliferation lead to the development of the multiple tumors that develop in a case of neurofibromatosis. So then when we researched the literature, we find a case report which was from uh, Istanbul and it was a 2020 uh, reported case which showed a giant composite pheochromocytoma and a gastrointestinal tumor. So there is an increased risk of these tumors to develop in neurofibromatosis, but the co-occurrence is very rare. And so far only 15 cases of giant of pheochromocytoma and uh, the gastrointestinal stromal tumor have been uh, presented. This was another case uh, of 2020 uh, in which there was also a co-occurrence of pheochromocytoma and gastrointestinal tumor in a patient of uh, neurofibromatosis. And then we found a single case report in which the triple malignancy was the first presentation of a neurofibromatosis as it was in our case. And uh, that, uh, in that case report, uh, there was a neuroendocrine tumor adjust and a pheochromocytoma in that patient. And it, it, it is also, then we find also case reports in which it was that the synchronous uh, presence of neuroendocrine tumor and GIST is very pathogenic of a neurofibromatoma. And this uh, were three case reports uh, from a Korean uh, journal. So the gastrointestinal tumor that are NF1 related, they are multiple, they are small and in size, they are of epithelioid variety, they are mostly of ROSE risk, and the molecular pathogenesis that lead to the uh, development uh, of these is to the RAS pathway and uh, the KIT mutation and the PGGFR mutation, alpha mutation is not uh, the causative uh, cause in these cases. And it has also therapeutic uh, implications because the uh, tyrosine kinase inhibitor may not be very effective in these uh, cases. So these are, they, these are the different molecular pathway that can lead to the causation of the tumors and mostly these are the low grade gist that present there. So the pheochromocytoma, they develop from the chromophobin cells as a result of the proliferation and uh, uh, mostly they are of uh, average size around five centimeter in NF patients, but sometimes a very huge size can also present. And the neuroendocrine tumor, they mostly develop in the, uh, and uh, the neuroendocrine tumors mostly develop in the ampullary region. That is why that there is obstructive jaundice, there are chronic pancreatitis, and they mostly, uh, uh, they are very high chance if it is a high gate tumor that metastasis to the liver or the lymph node may be present because the ampullary area is very rich uh, in vascular network, so they may be uh, metastasized uh, due to that. So the patient, uh, so far they have been more than six months, he is well, uh, he has uh, um, regular follow-ups uh, with CT scans and other uh, modalities. And uh, the, uh, the learning uh, from this case is that patients with neurofibromatosis should be, uh, surveillance should be done uh, on regular basis. And if a patient of neurofibromatosis develop hypertension, uh, pheochromocytoma should be ruled out. Thank you very much for the patience. Thank you, Dr. Ahmeen. Now I, now I request over chair Dr. Sajid Mushtaq and co-chair Dr. Umar Chaktai to come on stage and distribute shield among the speakers. Dr. Saira Rathor. Mm -hmm. 
Dr. Ahmadine. Uh, now I request Haji, Now I request General Hafiz to come on stage and present shield to our worthy chair and co-chair. Brigadier Sajid Mushtaf. Dr. Omar Shaktai. Now, as a token of commitment of your commitment to the Histopathology Society, as Histopathology and Cytopathology Society of Pakistan, the lifetime membership shields will be distributed by Dr. By Journal Hafiz to the members. And the first one is Dr. Muhammad Mumtaz Khan from Foji Foundation. Muhammad Bilal from Shifa. Dr. Nasir Sleem, who is currently working in Saudi Arabia, but he is unfortunately not available to receive their shield. Uh, Brigadier Azhar Mubarak, and he is currently working at Qadrasam International Medical College. Unfortunately, he is not here. Dr. Athar Dil. Dr. Saleem Sadiqi. Dr. Anwar Ali. Dr. Saruna Harun, Dr. Rais Abbas Lai, Dr. Naima Tariq. Dr. Nurulain, Dr. Imtiaz Ahmed Qureshi, Dr. Maria Aslam, Dr. Muhammad Asif, Dr. Nadeem Zafar, Dr. Naseem Ahmed, Dr. Fosia Rao, Dr. Shagufta Nasir, Dr. Masroor Hassan, Dr. Sayyid Mahmood Hassan, Dr. Dr. Bushra Parveen. Uh, now I request Dr. Shahid Parveen to come on stage to present uh, PAP Life Membership Shields. Uh, Dr. Shahida Ashraf, Dr. Nadeem Zafar, Dr. Asif Loya, Dr. Bushra Parveen. Dr. Neela Mansoor. Dr. Naseema Iqbal. Dr. Sayyid Salman Ali. Dr. Fozia Sheikh.
डॉक्टर फरा कलसूम एंड डॉक्टर मदीहा मिनहास इज वन मोर सर्टिफिकेट फॉर डॉक्टर हसीब फॉर मॉडरेटिंग द सेशन He was working hard at the backstage. <laughs> I'm, I, I think I'm announcing my own there. There is a last talk on development of pap test conventional to liquid based cytology by Mohsen Al Muhammad Al Kurdi. Uh, good evening, Assalamu alaikum warahmatullah. It's uh, a very great pleasure uh, being uh, here in Pakistan today and uh, with you all. It's a very great honor uh, to have the opportunity to speak about uh, uh, conventional versus liquid based uh, cytology. I'm Mohsen Al-Kurdi, Clinical Education Manager for Hologic, and uh, we're supporting uh, Pakistan uh, in, in terms of improving the cytology diagnostic uh, words. Talking about the cytology, we've seen a lot of a great presentation on the pathology, on the histopathology, and uh, uh, to some extent covers some of the cytology, but as we all know, the cytology or the cells are the major component or the main component of every living thing is not only uh, the human body. So we have in our human body around 200 different type of cell and every, every single cell doing a, a different kind of function. This function depends on the shape and the form of the cell. The core of studying the human body, the, the pathology science, is to studying the cell morphology and to ensure that that cells are doing their, uh, their job. So we, we need to ensure and study when the good cells go bad. That is the, uh, the cytology uh, science about. So uh, we all know that the, the cytology or the cells, one of their major function or creating the human uh, uh, body or the living cells is to, to, to do the, the cell growth or the cell uh, divide. When we have the, the cell actually or the DNA duplicate and replicate into two copies within the, the nucleus, and then the nucleus will divide the whole cell, going to divide into two identical cells. And how, this is subhanAllah, how the, the, the things is growing within, I will not say human, but in every single uh, living thing. This is how uh, 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 many cells look like from uh, divided by, by one cell. Uh, majority when the cells goes bad, that mean when we have uh, uncontrolled cell growth. And that is in basic simple language, that is the cancer. It is, you know all that it's an uncontrolled uh, cellular growth without no control, no order from the human brain or the, no function for the human body. Uh, unfortunately, we have uh, some facts to share about the, the cancers. Uh, it is the highest cause of death after the heart attack across the world. Uh, as per the, uh, uh, we had around uh, 27, uh, sorry, we are, we are over 12 million cases, uh, annual cancer for new cases globally, and that is what's, what's recorded. And it's expected to reach uh, 27 million annual new cases by 2030. Again, that is what, what is recorded. recorded. Uh, what good, good news that the men, 50% getting uh, one of, if, of every two men is under uh, the risk of getting cancer. A good news for ladies though, because one of each three ladies uh, expected or, or in, in uh, danger to take cancer. How cancer be detected? It's with, with either uh, the uh, tissue or surgery, blood test, uh, X-rays, uh, and basically the, the, the cytopathology or the pathology pathologists need to, um, you know, uh, confirm that the, the cells are really in, in a cancer mode of a growth. So we have several types of, of uh, uh, pathology application to detect, uh, or say cytology application to detect those cancers, or several case uh, reasons for cancers. Basically, either can be genetic, 
or can be environment, and I'm not going to uh, keep you for long and discuss that in details. And when we, we discuss that the cells um, have cancer or uncontrolled growth, we need to measure categorization uh, and, and see like characteristic characteristics uh, things on the cell itself, on the nucleus, and on the cytoplasm. We need to ensure that the cytoplasm to the nuclear ratio are uh, within the uh, shapes or the, the color, the actual color of the nuclei. If there is a, a, a nuclei a component appearing or the genetic material, uh, sometimes they're visual within the nucleus and as you can see few uh, pictures of, of cells goes bad or, or cancer cells. We cannot talk about cytology and not mentioning uh, George Papanikolaou, the, the father of the modern cytology. And he his, his famous development for the Baptist back in the 1940s, I think 46, when he developed the, the cervical Baptist and it became like an annual at that day, that there's annual uh, kind of uh, examination for the cervix. Talking about the cervix, and this is the majority or the major application of the uh, cervical, uh, of, of the cytology science itself, Majority of the of the samples we're getting in the cytology are, cer are cervical cancer, or we call them a gynecological cancer. We just need to ensure that we are collecting uh, the sample very proper to, to have a proper released re uh, report. And in, in the pathology in the laboratory, we have no patients. So we need to ensure that, you know, whoever dealing with the patient is the collecting the sample properly and sufficiently in order to ensure that we give the uh, proper diagnostic. Uh, back in the days, the conventional cytology, it's, it's to collect the sample and smear it directly on the slide and send it to the, to the lab to, to study the nucleus, uh, shape, as we said, the nucleus to cytoplasm ratio and the DNA availability there. Uh, some microscopic criteria for the cells. We have the, the cellular arrangement itself. We can consider the cytoplasmic texture, the uh, nucleus to cytoplasm ratio, and the nuclei or the background uh, can give us as well uh, some understanding of the patient conditions. We can use the cytology science and screening and looking for microorganism, candida, or some, some type of bacteria. Uh, pre-cancer uh, and uh, diagnose definitely uh, the cancer. So a successful BAP smear, it's, uh, since introduction in the early years, BAP smear has saved thousands of lives uh, since the 40s, since being implemented. It's early detection and, and giving us or giving the, the, gy the gynecologist or the clinicians a better clear understanding of the uh, you know, female health or uh, ladies' health. Uh, though we have, I mean, it was a very successful, but we have a very kind of, of limitation and, and tough procedure during the collection. And um, there is a lot of studies says that around 80% of the cells will be lost during collection and smearing it on the slide. So usually, uh, or the, the, the very simple, easy protocol is to collect the sample from the cervix, directly smear it on the, uh, on the slide, and then throw out the device. And that is actually, as I said, almost 80% of the cells uh, might be lost during that protocol, which is collection and transfer it to the device. And as you can see, and you are the expert of seeing it under the microscope, it is taking a lot of efforts and time from your time uh, to, to ensure that we are diagnosis and reporting the accurately uh, the cells. So moving or introducing the new methods or the new uh, liquid-based cytology, which actually uh, honestly and honored uh, to, to work for this company. Hologic has the one who developed the, the liquid-based cytology. That was 1996, and they maintained uh, the U.S. claim or the FDA claim on it, which become like uh, uh, the, the way to, to go or the new standard method of uh, studying cytology. Again, we have still to collect the sample from the cervix using a broom and then uh, uh, Rains it very well in a, in a liquid-based uh, vial. Vial includes some liquids, and I'll talk about the component of the liquids in a while, and then ensure that we're rinsing it well in that liquid and give it to the machine. Machine will, will, will create a standard or a very, uh, I would say, properly smeared cell, thin layer, crispy cells uh, layer, which gonna be uh, stained as usual 
and immediately uh, seen by a pathologist. And as you can see, the, the, the difference is very clear between the two slides. That actually has solved a lot of, of issues. As I said, the, the solution has been introduced or launched or maintained the, the US FDA on it in, in 1996. Uh, it is the, the it, it contain kind of a methanol based uh, preservative. It is a very safe to preserve the cells themselves is not, because it's methanol is not ethanol. So it is less impacting on the cell morphology itself. And it is way safer on the DNA RNA material because you know, um, a very much linked to, to the cervical health. It is the, the uh, HPV where we need to check for the human papilloma virus present and if it's there or not there, and that is due to, or uh, with the molecular testing and molecular techniques. Using those kind of, of preservative uh, allow us to, to extend the shelf life of the cytology test itself to around six weeks and uh, to the molecular uh, to around uh, four weeks of, of stability from the same vial. The method uh, working very easy uh, that, that the system will, or the, the uh, machine or the uh, processor will ensure that all the cell is distributed properly within the vial itself. So there will be kind of a mixing step within the machine itself. It will mix uh, that uh, cytology suspension or cell suspension, I would say. And then a filter will be inserted automatically into the vial. The filter will be aspirating some uh, liquid. When the filter pours fully saturated in the uh, saturated, then the filter will be flipped side up down and they stamp those cells into the, uh, uh, the slide, giving us a, a two centimeter diameter cell spot ready to be uh, stained and uh, you know, examined by the pathologist. I won't say, say much in this slide. I think the comparison is very clear from you know, uh, eye perspective. It is whoever has that uh, opportunity to work on liquid-based cytology will really feel the difference and how much it's going to save effort and turnaround time from the pathologist time and less, way less effort uh, producing uh, the, the cell. Uh, it is not only applied or applicable for the gynecological sample. There is a lot of application for it in the uh, non-gyne samples. So uh, it, it is applied for every single um, cytology sample. So any liquid, CSF liquid, even on urine, uh, if there is a urine, uh, samples need to be examined for cytology. Uh, FNA, fine needle aspiration, thyroid, it is actually one of the most recommended method. And uh, there is a lot of publication, third party and studies supporting that. I will be just sharing a few of those studies uh, outcome. It, it is uh, saying that around 33% higher in sensitivity uh, liquid-based cytology compared to the uh, conventional cytology, and that is uh, very clear. Significant improvement in disease detection uh, for liquid-based cytology compared, again, to the uh, conventional. Detecting sent to and above cells are way easier and more applicable using the liquid-based cytology. There is a CAB study launched and published in 2006 comparing the liquid-based cytology and the uh, conventional, and we have almost 100% more uh, sensitivity or um, ability to detect uh, cells. And sensitivity, as you can see, it's, it's around 87% compared to the conventional in this particular study for uh, detecting adenocarcinoma from uh, granular disease uh, compared to the 55% in the conventional cytology. Under the microscope, the, the difference will be very clear, and in, in the lab preparing it, the difference will be very clear. It is US FDA approved, as well as CE mark, to do the cytology, gyne, non gyne, and uh, uh, out of the vial molecular testing. And I will just put some uh, microscopic slides uh, of, of some cancers from non gyne and uh, from gyne as well. So you could have a, a taste how the slides of liquid-based cytology will look like under the microscope. So this one is adenocarcinoma for a pronocular brush. Uh, adenocarcinoma as well. Adenosacomoys carcinoma. And small cell anaplastic carcinoma. 
Crawlers fluid, uh, again, small cell anaplastic carcinoma. Uh, lymphoma here from FNA from the neck. And uh, again, FNA from uh, lung. It is very recommended, actually, it's the latest study is, is recommending to use the uh, liquid based for the FNA. Yet it can be, it's gonna be kind of a technical uh, work to do it on, on the Nangaini side. So we have kind of a centrifugation and to ensure you know that we're uh, gathering the sample properly. As you can see, there is a very minimum background on the Nangaini. This is a urine sample. And as you can see, it is the, the urine even because the, the less cellularity in the urine, so the cell spot will be smaller than two centimeter. It will be almost eight millimeter cell spot. So it, it's gonna be concentrated all the cell in, in that small uh, diameter. This is urine on 40X. And this is again, pure fluid, FNA from the lung. And this is a few other cases on, on gyne. So it's a negative with endocervical uh, cells, a negative with TV infection, candida infection. It is very obvious and clear to, or easy to, to uh, diagnose in liquid-based cytology. And uh, borderline nuclear change. So we can say that it's ASCUS, I think. Uh, low cell grade and with, uh, with HBV infection. Uh, high grade uh, HSIL, sicoma cell uh, carcinoma, and cervical glandular endopithelial neoplasia, endocervical adenocarcinoma, and endomaterial adenocarcinoma. So at the end, I just wanted to, to give a quick comparison or, you know, kind of introduction to the liquid base. I know in Pakistan, we, we still yet to go adopting this technology, the key centers, or it is there in the key places or key centers, and they do feel the difference from all aspects. Most important for me or for us in Hologic is to accurately diagnose patient, which will be way less efforts uh, using that uh, liquid base. And thank you uh, again for the opportunity and for the time. Thank you so much. And thank you all of you for attending the session. Thank you.